Hi, this is Jonathan Pines. I'm here with Rupert Neve Designs on the floor of the AES Convention 2013. Standing next to me is Larry Crane, a legend in this industry, owner of Jackpot Studios, publisher of Tape Op Magazine, wonderful guy. This guy knows a lot about music. He's going to tell us a little bit about some projects he's been working on and what he's been up to. Yeah, hey, um, I'm the editor of Tape Pop Magazine. Should I My redo friend. this? Yeah, no, no, it's okay. I can just correct you. Okay. No, lately I've been working on, um, I mixed Jolie Holland's new record, which will be out next year, and Anti Records, uh, which is one of the most coolest records I've ever worked on, I believe. And uh, I did the strings and a bunch of overdubs for She and Him's new record that came out this wow. year. And, man, I have so many projects going all the time. I've done a lot of local bands, a lot of really good bands like Mission Spotlight and Cotton and some really cool records. So yeah, I'm always busy. What's your favorite band that we've never heard of that we all should know about? Okay, this band Cotton that I just recorded, I did it in um, five days I made a record. And I actually... That's how it gets done. This is how it gets done. We had seven days booked and we ended up not needing two of them. I mixed the record in one day. I tracked entirely to analog tape 24-track and mixed a quarter-inch tape, and it was all mixed through. Guess what? A Rupert Neve Designs 5088 console. Oddly enough, you appear that you own one of these at Jackpot Recording. I do. When I saw the blueprints uh, at a NAMM show in the basement a long time ago, I saw these blueprints, and I said, yes. And then I was really scared. I didn't even say yes that I would be able to purchase one even, but I just said, yes, a new Rupert Neve console is going to be a very good thing indeed, and that's what I want, and my dreams came true eventually. I think I own console number 27, actually, and um, it's 32 channels in. It does not have a penthouse. It doesn't have any equalization or mic preamps in it, and it is simply 32 channels plus the aux returns and the uh, bus area and um, it's all mixing and routing. Wow. And so, I really love it. How does it. What are some of the things that you feel that going out of the box and having a real console gives you? Now, I know that some of your projects are all analog, but let's face it, it's yeah. a modern world. Some oh, of your yeah. projects are in Pro Tools. And what does coming out of the box do for you? Well, the majority of the stuff I do is definitely in Pro Tools. And a lot of sessions I'll do, I'll even track, like, say, drums and the basics to 16 track 2 inch, dump it into Pro Tools, continue working and mix through the console. I mean, part of, when I try to mix in the box internally, I'm really not very satisfied. I've never have been. I, I've, I grew up in the analog realm, of course, and have worked it that way for years, but it just felt to me that even the workflow wasn't quite right. It's very left brain, and when my hands are on faders and mutes and, and turning aux knobs and trim controls and all the little things, it's very intuitive, and I, I think people have to remember that making records is an art, and it is an art form, and we are artists. We are called engineers sometimes, but it's a little bit of uh, a misnomer, and that when we get our hands on there and we can move intuitively and work really quickly and well, that's when we're really creating art. And to have that situation and to have enhanced sonics and to have you know, a transformer balance console, a high voltage console. This is the highest voltage rails of any console that I've ever seen. Um, to have the, the headroom, to have the clarity, to have a bit of character. If you push it really hard, you can feel transformers kind of doing some certain things. You can feel the mix bus. If you just go ridiculous, if your meters, <laughs> if your meters are just stuck to the right, and then you back off your mix bus, sometimes you can get kind of a, a little bit of a punk rock crunch or... You get that nice gluing yeah, effect of something. saturating the, the, and if the you uh, don't, bus. And if you don't want that, you don't set it up that way. And it really has a bit of character if you want it there. If you don't, I do classical things on there as well. I do situ uh, real acoustic based songwriter records. I do all kinds of music. And I feel like it, it always brings something good to it. So, you know, to me, if I was mixing these in the box, they'd be a little lifeless, they'd be a little less uh, uh, intuitively built, and they, they would be more uh, thought out. And I think they would be inferior, less, less, the quality of my recordings would be less, wow. just right out the gate. Something we talked about the last time when we were uh, sitting around having a drink was the importance of headphone mixes and having the artist actually be able to hear the right thing when they're working. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's something that I think that 
for me at least, an analog console is really important for. And how does that work for you? You know what? I, I totally, my, okay, my studio manager, Kendra Lynn, always builds her mixes um, through the auxes, because you have eight aux, auxes there, and he has some very great features like the pan or not pan, you know, where you can set up for level and pan or just set up for two independent levels. Um, and she builds like the beginning mixes for the headphones with those, and I actually never do. And I use uh, the Furman uh, HRM16 system, and I'll molt. I do a lot of molting in the studio, so when I'm tracking the tape, I will actually uh, molt into the headphone mixer off of the tape deck, and then molt into the console, and molt into Pro Tools if I'm going to dump to Pro Tools. So I have it going three different places. I monitor through the console, they make their own headphone mixes, and then we can also dump right into Pro Tools when we get a take we like. Wow. And they can punch in an overdub on tape the way that's set up too. So that's a little complicated, but it, it's a fantastically flexible system. And um, it allows me just to treat the console as, what was really important to me in that scenario is like I could be avoiding the console and I could listen through Pro Tools, mm -hmm. but this gives me the best signal path to hear what exactly like is coming through my microphone and preamp chain or coming back off a of tape. It's the best path that I can get, you know, where I can really hear the difference. And that's one of the things I noticed when I first bought the 5088, was that all of a sudden I became even more critical of my mic choices and placement because of the clarity of what I was hearing through the console, which is something that's rarely spoken about when people talk about, say, tracking directly into Pro Tools. You know, you're going through con conversion mm -hmm. and you're, you're coming back through that system. There's a lot of possibilities of gain structure error. There's a lot of possibilities of converter quality affecting the quality of what you're hearing as opposed to what you're actually capturing. So well, these are these are the, and, and and digital summing as well. And and it's such a uh, a thing now that when people talk about doing alternative types of music, and you're talking about you do a whole range of things. Quite but a even bit. when you're doing some alternative rock things that you think are more vibey and maybe less hi-fi than some other sure. things, the ability of know what you're putting on tape is very critical. Oh yeah, it's still important. You know, you if you don't have a good signal chain just to monitor through, you might be adding in frequencies and 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 uh, transient characteristics that you don't desire in your music. So you need to be able to hear better than you're recording. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's, that's the important part. Well said. Larry, can you tell us what's coming up at Jackpot? What, do you got, what are you looking at for uh, uh, the rest of this year and into next year? I'm, I'm having a hard time remembering. Um, I'm going to be doing a lot. I do a lot of mixing for people that uh, sometimes attended, sometimes unattended. And so I do have some projects like that. I know I've got some tracking projects that are going to be uh, tracking songwriters over programmed beats from Ableton Live. Um, I've got just a, it's kind of a crazy amount of different stuff. I'm gonna, I'm flying down to Long Beach after this show to actually work with a band that moved to the Bay, uh, to LA recently and then I'm gonna What's the name of there. that band? They're called Space Waves. They would love it if they heard their name on here. <laughs> well, now they have. And, uh, uh, uh one of the other things that's, that's wonderful about what you do is you're such a great promoter of the art of recording and what's important in this. And yeah. tell us how you uh, how you were able to bring that to the table, both with your work through Tape Op and just as a great brand promoter for the analog world. Well, I think that one of the things, when I saw digital recording mediums come in, I saw like the original... Uh, uh, was it Sound Tools, mm -hmm. you know? Sound, free, tool, or sound, sound tools, tools, one and two. Yeah, I, I saw one of those original versions of that. We used it to, to compile and, and put a CD together back in the early, early 90s, like 91 or something. Uh, I saw some of that original stuff and I, I understood what it was. In fact, even at the time I said, oh, you could sculpt white noise and you could build constructions. And John Bacigalupi, my partner in Tape Op, looked at me and said, what are you talking about? But anyway, um, you know, the thing that I've always realized is like a lot of times artists really do want to make classic sounding records. And when I say that, I mean records from the past, you know? So if you are starting to adopt recording methodologies that throw that out the window, you're, you're, gonna, you're not gonna get there. So to me, a really important factor is to think of like, how was a Neil Young record tracked and made? And how was this, how were different records made? Now you might still be in there editing and doing things that would have not been quite as easily possible in the analog only realm if you're using a computer but if you set certain ground rules at the beginning and you also mic and record the music from a perspective as if you're just going to tape or something even if you're not you know it'll start it'll make you think in a more musical way and that's the stuff I try to bring into it uh, with my work in tape op 
I really, I hope that no, I used to be a little bit anti-digital uh, when, when I first started the magazine and I would do little jabs here and there. We all started as Luddites. You know, and well, and the ADATs were, were still kind of popular. And I think the ADAT format, I, I, when I first heard about the, even the existence of it, I knew that it was failed, flawed, a bad idea because we should be You recording. mean your mom had stopped using her VHS already? Yeah, yeah, she had. And well, the idea of, of recording to any kind of like moving medium even a hard drive is still a stupid idea because you, you, you're, you're looking at failure, you know, you're looking at mechanical failure issues. And so I knew that the future of recording digitally was going to have to be a, at least certainly turned into a hard drive thing and, and hopefully real soon turn into a solid state issue where there's less chances of failure and less chances of read errors and stuff like that. So I, when I opened my studio, I even, in 1996, I was even, or seven, I was... I bought a 16-track 2-inch to say I'm not building in one of those ADAT studios because they were very prolific. And I also knew that way I wouldn't have to buy like extra ADATs so like, they'd be in the shop and all that bullshit. Or wait 25 seconds for them to lock up. Yeah, to lock up. I've seen that. Um, so I went into the analog realm in that case just to kind of wait it out, you know. And, um, you know, I gradually got Pro Tools after it turned into LE version. I started, I bought a 001, 002 wasn't very happy with those. Um, moving into the HD realm it was better, and that's probably when I started to kind of go, okay, this can be all right. And it wasn't really even like sonic issues or stuff. It was just like reliability, mm -hmm. usability. Um, and also learning how to, to make a hybrid work path yeah. suit your path, your choice of making records Absolutely. the best way. You know, now, now I, 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 I will pick a medium based on the project at hand. I'll say, you know, if you do this on tape, it'll probably save time. Or if you don't do this on tape, we'll probably save time. So I, you know, I want my clients to get their records done. I want to get done on a budget. Sometimes I get done days early, like I was saying. You know, which is pretty nice if you're a client. Yeah, call me. <laughs> um, but for me, it's you know, you you, I, I'm a service industry. I want my people to come in and work with me and leave so much more excited than they would have ever imagined. And I want them to come back, and many many do, and they have over our 17 year lifespan of the studio. We've had so many repeat clients, you know, and I wanted to offer them something they can't probably put together at home, you know, an environment with headphone mixers, an environment with a fantastic console. Good choice of microphones. Great microphones, Burl audio conversion in our mothership. I mean, tape decks that are in perfect running condition, you know. A, Which is rare and rarer these yeah. days. And a lot of outboard equipment, a lot of analog outboard equipment that's top of the game plate reverb, spring reverb, tape delays, old school stuff. And we can make, you know, records that are timeless with this equipment. That's my whole goal. And how do you, you know, you're pretty well known for the fact that you can shift genres very well. You're not a, you're not a niche guy. You're not stuck in one thing. Yeah. And you work with a lot of different kinds of clients. And how are you able to do that? How are you able to change hats that easily? Um, I think about the paycheck. <laughs> no, really. I mean, it is an economic transaction. I used to be a waiter, you know. I'd wait on anybody. So, to me, I love music, and I'm I. When I go to the record store, I always figure the clerk's gonna be like, "What's what's wrong with this guy?" Because it'll be from every part of the store, you know. There'll be a CD. So, I'm not like a genre specific guy, even though I was. I've been certainly known for like indie rock, college rock stuff through working with Elliot Smith, yeah, Slater, so, Slater Kenny. Yeah. You got fame for certain projects, yeah, yeah. but but you do a lot of different stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I've done jazz records, I've done hip hop records, I've done acoustic records, I've done bluegrass records, I've done songwriter rock records, I've done things that just don't fit into the college radio world at all. Um, and that just, for me, it comes from wanting to keep the studio open and, and also from my, I mean, the day I opened my home studio, I was doing bluegrass bands, I was doing metal bands. I was doing local indie rock bands, uh, songwriters, you know, everything. So to me, that music's pretty wide open, you know. I would love to do more like reggae or, or soul stuff, like classic style. There's I don't, some opportunities out there. Yeah, I mean, there's things like that that I'm a huge fan of. And my record collection is massive. <laughs> and I love so many, so many genres. So, you know, I've done country records. That's another one, you know. So... You know, I, I just, because I'm a fan of music, and for me to go to work every day and it's always a little different is fantastic, you know. There's no, when you, when you have to shift gears and think of records in a different light, 
then you have different tasks to accomplish, different things to think about. It's great. It makes job the job fantastic. It's pretty awesome to go to work every day and be excited about it, isn't it? I really do appreciate that, you know, and I, I think I'm even less likely to be dismissive or grouchy than I was when I opened the studio, you know, 17 years ago. So I think I'm more so even more now like I get paid more than I was paid then. And I, and I think I am so lucky to have a nice, a, a decent wage and uh, sit in a, in, a, in a comfortable chair with some good monitors and listen to people playing music together. And or Kind of sounds it. like a dream. Yeah, I think it's all right. <laughs> okay, so we're wrapping up here with Larry Crane, editor of Tape Op Magazine from the AES Floor 2013. Thanks, Larry. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Yay. Okay.